Yeah, so thank you for coming. I know it's late. I know you probably, your heads are very full. I'm hoping that this will be entertaining, maybe a little shorter with time for questions afterwards. And um, we'll try and have fun. This is kind of, this is the stuff I nerd out on. So my job is an interaction designer. And I made this terrible mistake of, um, sorry, we should, uh, I should remind you to rate the session and do all the things. Um, I made this terrible mistake um, of going from being an academic psychologist, where I was interested in uh, how people think and learn and perceive information, to working in user experience and design. And it is basically, the psychology has basically ruined me forever, <laughs> because everywhere I see things that are like, no, no, and not only from a usability point of view, but I'm like, this is such an obvious gotcha from a psychology point of view, because of how people perceive information. and. Anyway, so um, this talk is because of my inability to like not deconstruct all of this stuff, um, but I hope it's useful. So the first thing I want to say is that orienting attention is like free and automatic. It just happens. So if I'm just sort of standing here talking and um, nope, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> this is going to be good. Never do live demos or never never have live clips. Will it play? It will not play. Well, this is just a delight. Excuse me. Why? 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. This is what happens. Yeah, I don't know why. It's fine, we'll move on. OK, so what's supposed to happen, actually, is not that. What's supposed to happen is that stuff is supposed to be distracting, but this will do just fine while you're looking at uh, the dinosaur and talking, and, and I'm talking. Um, you're probably still looking at the dinosaur. That's a good thing from an evolutionary point of view. It's really important that you are aware of threats. And so what happens is your attention is constantly reorienting to new things. Everything could be a threat. Also, from an evolutionary point of view, some things could be useful, right? Some things might be food. So you want to notice those, but possibly even more important, you want to notice all threats. Most of them are not these. Um, in fact, all of them should be not these ever in the entirety of human history. But everything is potentially a threat, and so your attention just shifts to it, and you need to be aware of it. You figure it out very quickly, and then you can move on. But the fact that everything needs to be checked is super important because it has consequences for how we design user experiences. So, let's see if this works. <laughs> OK. So you can see that there's like a banner ad up at the top that's kind of when I'm scrolling. It's kind of clicking in and out of place. And that's sort of OK. But it takes a lot of space, right? It's absolutely impossible for me anyway. It's absolutely impossible not to notice it. And it's helpful. This is a helpful function. But it's just kind of intrusive when I maybe don't want it to be intrusive. I'm just scrolling up and down reading, right? And it just pops up. I think a way that I might have done this better was maybe just not so much visual, visual weight. It's a big, big black banner, and it just stretches across the whole screen. And it's just so much to process. So visual weight is a huge, huge magnet for attention, right? The more ink, if you can imagine that the, the web and software and anything that you put on the screen has ink, then the, the more ink and the darker ink, the more it will pull attention. So it's a big attention magnet. And that's great. It's really good when you want it. But when you don't, it's not good, because it pulls attention from what the user is trying to do. Um, so where is the visual weight here? This isn't going to animate. This is just a web page. Where is it? The red part, yep, very much. Even more weight on the Sudestilens, uh, if that's how it's pronounced, polity. Um, and like there and there, all the really dark places, right, are just, you can feel your gaze just getting pulled into those. This is actually less for me. This is less of a magnet because there's almost nothing in it. As soon as you look at it, you're like, oh, well, that's empty. I'll just move on. All your attention is doing is just checking stuff out. And then if it's interesting, maybe you'll stay there. Maybe you'll read or look at a picture. If it's not interesting, you'll move. So although this pulls all the weight for me, 
This stuff here is more interesting, and I'm going to spend more time here, particularly here, because that's super dark, that car and stuff. I don't know what that is, so I'm going to spend a bit of time checking that out. So if you think about it as being weight plus detail, then that's kind of roughly where your attention will go on the page. I used to work in the UK, and we worked on a lot of services for Gov.UK, which is the kind of the state's um, platform for digital services for the whole, um, the whole population of the UK. And I worked on the visa service, and we had so many discussions about this. This is a start page for one of the visa services, uh, which is just check to see if you need a UK visa to come to the UK. The button is really good. It's a really strong call to action. It's great. And it's so strong that the first thing people do when they come to this page is they just go straight to the button, because it's a great button. But the consequence of this is that they often don't read further. And there was debate constantly about, but what if you need to know stuff before you start on a page like this? Where should we put it? But you don't want people to have to scroll all the way down to the, you know, like down the page, because maybe they're coming here quite often. So you want to let them start as soon as they want to. But you also want them to read other stuff. What do you do? So we experimented with tabs. Do you know, do you hide some of the information? Or where do you put the button? And I think this was the least bad. There's no good way of doing this. And I have the same problem in my current job in Norway, where you want people to get right in, if they, especially if they've done it before and they know what they're doing. At the same time, for people who don't, you want to say, oh, here's lots of helpful information. And the better you make that button, the harder you're making it for people to read the information. So I'm thinking that um, the strength of that button is partly why the, uh, the links underneath are bold. They're, they're there to take a lot, of, um, a lot of weight and attention. If they were just plain text with no kind of bold or no thick text, it would be hard. It would be just too easy to just miss them. And don't even, no one looks here. Nobody is looking at that column. Unless you're super lost or you've just kind of completely lost focus, you're probably not looking up there. This is kind of interesting. I was looking for examples. Uh, it's much easier to find bad examples than good. Uh, so a lot of this today will be what not to do and, and what to think about when you're, you're making some kind of uh, user interface next time. This was really interesting. It's not very high def, I'm afraid. But what I found interesting about this is that can you see which row is selected? So can you see which kind of sheet has been brought up? It's the gray one, right? It's the kind of slightly darker gray. And for me, this is a huge missed opportunity, because it's good that we see which, which document is open. So on the right, we've got this open document, and it seems like it's that one on the left um, of the list that's highlighted in gray. But wouldn't it be even better if all of the other titles that weren't selected were not bold? It would just make so much difference. You would just understand which one you were looking at. Obviously, that doesn't work if this is some kind of inbox, right? because then it would, there would be a whole red on red thing. But my feeling is that this would be a much clearer situation, because they've now used, they've just used shading. But for someone with low vision, for example, that will barely be perceptible. And it would be just so much more clear, I think, if they just made all the other titles not bold. I think a lot about rhythm and tempo. Uh, so how we lay stuff out how we present stuff in space and in time hugely affects how we perceive. And it is really important for the flow of information that it doesn't come in a way that is jerky, and it doesn't come in a way that makes it difficult to parse. This is an example I found. Again, I'm sorry, it's not terribly high res. But where do you even start? Just read this for a moment. Where does your attention go? Sort of <laughs> the corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I should do that. What happened to like being in display mode, just switching off alerts? OK, I'm going to take rid of that. I'm going to get rid of that. Thank you for letting me know. Good job, everyone. Nope, not you. All right. It's nice to have audience participation. That wasn't quite what I was expecting, but thank you. Right, so what's happening here? Like, nobody is steering our attention in this, right? 
So what happens to me, it might be different for you, what happens to me is that I kind of start with good intentions up at the top left, and then I just get kind of lost. Like, I'm kind of floating around, and like while I'm doing that, my attention is fighting to pull me down here, because this is where all the ink is, right? It's all big, and it's heavy, and it's a picture, and I want to look at pictures. Pictures are basically free attention, because they're quick to process, your eye just wants to go there, and you can kind of do the work, figure it out, and move on very quickly. So when you see, for example, newspapers, it's most common that they print the picture and then they have a caption or a headline underneath that. If you do it the other way around, you don't read the headline. So if you have the, the title, the story title at the top and then a picture underneath, it's too easy just to go straight to the picture and then you don't read the headline. So this is just pulling me right out of that. And there's no steering. Nobody is driving, no pun intended, I know it's a tractor, but nobody is driving the attention steering here is just a mess. So we need to do better than that. We need to give people something to focus on. This I found kind of interesting. Like, this is done well. I'm going to play an animation. And this is a kind of, I'm not, nothing is animating here. But what I liked about this is that doing a really nice job of just handling what happens to your attention. So. Just let it scroll when I play it, and just notice where your attention goes, and just have a think about how many of these stories you're actually kind of looking at on the way down. If it goes, oh, it's going to be that kind of day. Please scroll. Oh, there we go. What do you think? Does it work for you? I mean, some nodding. OK. I like it. I think it's actually quite skillful. Like, they're using, like, you've got big to the left, but even bigger to the right. And they're balancing the size of the images. And everything's a little bit offset. But they're kind of balancing the size of the typeface with the size of the image. And it just kind of works. And. Actually, the thing that made me most interested in stuff like this was just looking at lots of things that animate, just looking at lots of things that, um, that have been designed. And you do the form design, and you realize it doesn't work, and you do it again. And just spending time understanding where your attention is going is really good use of your time, because you start becoming a more conscious consumer of the, um, the attention that is being drawn, if you like, and you start understanding where your attention went. And so the more time you spend looking at stuff like this and trying to understand where your attention just disappeared to, the more useful it will be for you when you're making user interfaces. This is where we get stuck on this, and it just goes forever. There we go. OK, good. Right. Executive is possible this battery is running out, in which case I'll swap it out in a moment. Um, executive function is nothing to do with men in suits, uh, but it is the set of behaviors that your mind or brain performs to try and manage everything that is happening for you. It is the kind of the controlling unit, if you like, of your mind. And it is responsible for several things, but these are kind of three really core things. Deliberate shifting of attention, updating information, and inhibiting inappropriate intrusions, which is unnecessarily alliterative. So what's happening here is deliberate shifting of attention is not when something distracts me, but rather, OK, I'm finishing here, and I'm going to look at something else now. You choose. You're driving. Updating information is, if you like updating a register or a log file or whatever, is when you've got new information, and you're like, right, OK, I'm going to park that somewhere. Maybe it has replaced the old information about what time it is or something like that. And inhibiting inappropriate intrusions is the ability to resist distractions. The ability to just go, yeah, I know, but I'm focusing on this task, and I'm going to finish this task. And these may sound like familiar processes. Failing at the last one is one of the things I do best in the world. Um, and we're going to have a look at some ways that we can make that a little bit easier for users. Is this going to do anything? No. What a delight. OK. If you look at this and keep looking at the dot, and keep looking at the dot. 
and keep looking at the dot and put your hand up when it just becomes unbearable and you want to stop looking at the dot. Keep looking, don't look away. Put your hand up if you already looked away. <laughs> put your hand up if you've looked away now. It's really hard, right? That's, you can put your hands down, thank you. It, it just gets harder and harder because your brain's like, okay, I've seen this, it's a yellow dot, it's not interesting, I got this. And it wants to go off and do other things because what if something's happening over there or over there? So you're always kind of monitoring around the periphery of where you're looking. And after you've got to a point, you're like, yeah, not, not interesting anymore. Okay, I've seen the dot, seen that it's yellow, I'm going to move. And resisting that urge to move on is basically impossible because your whole attentional system is constructed to, to move on, to, you know, after this should not, this yellow dot should not consume all your attention. Save that for the Tyrannosaurus Rex. That is the important thing. Another way that you can kind of deflect people's attention is killing them with information that's not well formatted. This is one instruction from one set of help notes from one tax form in the UK. This is just to fill in one box. I'll let you read. I'm a native speaker of English. I don't know what this means. This is really hard. It's not helping me. It's using a lot of words I don't know. My brain just slides right off like butter. It's, I can't. You know, they've been kind and they've used some bold text at the top and they've broken this down into paragraphs at least, but I can't really make it through a paragraph. I find it so hard. So, in order to keep people's attention, we have to be really clever on the page. We have to keep things short. We have to consider um, whether we could format things more clearly. We could put a little bit more space in between. So back to tempo again, right? This is soup. This has no tempo. This is just homogenous porridge, whatever. Now, there's a thing called inattentional blindness. And you may have, there's a video that's kind of really classic, and I'm not going to show you that uh, because I think everyone's seen it. So I thought I'd show you something else. And the concept here is that when you're not paying attention to stuff, you, well, when you're paying attention to one specific thing, lots of other things can happen around, and you don't notice because your focus is here. And we talk about attention as being like a zoom lens on a camera where you can focus really in, and then you can kind of come out again and maybe focus on something else. But while you're in that tight focus on something, lots of other things can be happening around the edges, and you have no idea. So I want you to assume when you design that you're designing for me and not for yourselves. Everyone who spotted that should feel very pleased with themselves, but just assume that you're designing for people like me who are like, oh, wow. Um, and uh, you'll be doing a good job for most people, I think. So that's the video. It's in the, the slides. Um, this is a much more kind of mundane ex uh, example, really. This is from uh, where I work. And what we wanted to do was just give people a bit of help in completing a form. So I work for the state in Norway, and uh, we're trying to get people to give information about when they have to stay away from work um, so that they can get paid uh, from work anyway. The state can pay them um, because they're not, they can't be at work because they have a sick child. So this is information you have to fill out about which employers you're going to be working for while your child is sick and while you're away from work. I think this battery is going. Not you. Yeah. OK, so now we've clicked on the thing. And we're going to choose this option here. And when we're writing in the box how many hours, and then we get the option to put it in hours or as a percent of your usual job. And while you're typing in this box here, there's a figure updating there based on what you're typing. But people don't see that. They're so focused on typing into the box that they don't see it's actually updating in real time. We'll just watch that again. So see that janky scrolling as well? That's also quite distracting. So they write in the box, and they say, OK, I want to give this as a percent of my normal job. So they click on the right. And then again, when they're writing in this box, it's calculating how many hours and minutes that is. But because every part of their attention is in that box right now, lots of people don't see that it's actually being helpful. So a good solution for that would be to place that updating text right underneath the box so it's a bit closer. 
But that scrolling as well, like the kind of the, the point where the page judders, that's not good either because that means people have to kind of reset. And this is a thing called change blindness. And I talked, if you were at the talk that I gave the other evening, I talked a little bit about change blindness, but I talked about a different kind. So change blindness can happen when over a long period of time you fail to notice a change. So a long, slow change in color or something gradually fading out. But there's another kind of change that's also an issue in designing front ends um, of any kind, really, which is that if you get a sudden brief blink or discontinuity, you have to kind of reset. For whatever reason, your visual attention just goes, OK, wait a minute, what's happening here? And you have to start all over again. And that's kind of interesting because it means that when things glitch like that or when you get a kind of a page doesn't load well and it kind of flickers or shudders, you're making people do more work. So what are the implications of something like that for design? Can we imagine? That flicker, you've seen that flicker, right? It happens lots of times. It happens when you dismiss a pop-up. It happens when a page flickers or reloads. It happens if your scrolling is a little bit off uh, and the page kind of stutters like that. All of that is enough to make someone miss details. And it means that they have to start over. So it makes the experience of understanding what is happening really difficult. And while it's tempting to say, just design so that that never happens, life is life. Web pages just hiccup sometimes. You know, your 4G drops out. All of these things happen. So maybe think about how to kind of mitigate that. What, how can you structure your page in a way that people will be able to recover easily? Where is the visual weight? Have you got the balance right? Are you thinking about size and placement so that when this happens, and it probably is when, not if, you'll be able to not have people just stop completely? This is a lovely example of what I just talked about. I'm just down the bottom of a web page, and the page is about to glitch. And notice what happens to your attention. Notice that. You kind of have to start over. And now I've primed you to think exactly that. But just have a think about, like, just experience what this is like, because I find it fascinating. So that was just going to the comments at the bottom of this page. It just kind of just hiccups there. The whole thing just goes. And I have to start again. It's horrible. Another discontinuity, this is a terrible stock photo. I think the idea with the green thing is that you're supposed to put your own text on the, uh, the whiteboard. I will not be doing that today. What happens when you type? Because you're here at this conference, I bet you type like this. Most other people, not so much. Most other people type like this. And when they look down, and when they look up, and when they look down and up, is exactly the same as what I'm talking about here. They have to start again. They have to reorient again. It's slow. So when you're designing, you have to think about the idea that people, if they're entering any kind of text, they might look down. If they're moving the mouse, they might even look down. Or if they're using a trackpad, they might even look down. So you have to think about how do you manage, how do you structure a page that is so clear in its design that people can quickly reorient themselves Another example of this kind of thing is actually if you're driving in the rain and you've got the wipers doing this, every time this happens is one of those blinks. And think about the jet engine again. The consequences of that are quite terrifying, right? The idea that you might miss something really important, like someone walking in the roads. Um, it, when, when you start thinking about this, you see it everywhere. It's really important to consider when we design experiences for the web. But it's also quite important to consider in real life as well. So, something you can use in your own free time as well as at work. But what about if you're someone for whom this is even harder, right? So for the most part, we're just talking about this as experiences that um, everyone in the room can share. But there are people who find this even harder to deal with and whose attention needs even more careful management. And remember, we talked about executive function before. So right, choosing to shift your attention choosing to update information um, as new information comes in, and choosing to not shift your attention as well. So deciding, actually, no, I'm going to ignore that distracting thing over there, whatever that is, I'm going to focus here. And some of these tasks are really, really hard. 
for some users, and some of you are those users. This is the thing, we are all these people. We're not, when we talk about accessibility, we're not designing this for some blind guy in a room somewhere. This is everybody. Accessibility is, affects everybody. So, for example, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, probably familiar with this. Classically, you're thinking of like a boy who's struggling to concentrate in class and is maybe running around a lot. But there's a lot of adults living with ADHD as well. And it's quite hard, and it makes it hard to focus, particularly avoiding distracting things. So that executive function ability to kind of go, OK, don't look at that, don't look at that, just do this, is really compromised in ADHD. Bipolar disorder also, um, some people who suffer from bipolar have the same issue, have attentional problems as well. The kind of the resisting distraction is, is harder, not for all, but for some. And so there's a lovely piece about designing for cognitive difficulties by a guy who has both ADHD and bipolar, which I highly recommend. Um, it will come to you in the slides, and it's, it's this URL here. And he talks about what it's like for him, and he talks about the things that are distracting and why he finds it so difficult. And I find it really interesting that he, as someone who is quite technology aware, he goes into like the Chrome developer tools and like turns off all the stuff. But most people can't do that. He's very lucky to be able to just kind of disable that stuff, but there's some sites he just won't go to because they're just so messy, so difficult. What do we have here? Okay, let's see if we can make this go. So, fun times. Here's someone using a tutorial on the web to show you what's happening, uh, moving the cursor, and that's great, but if you're trying to read the text around this, and you're struggling with something like ADHD, you've got an ad as well just kicking in at the right moment. Imagine that you're trying to read and your attention's just constantly being pulled up there because of these things animating. And there's no way to turn these off sometimes, depending on how people embed these. And so something that's meant to be helpful here is actually really hard. You think about how many things animate on the web, right? This is actually for the benefit of the person reading the article to show them what the article is talking about. But if it comes at the expense of your actually understanding and reading the piece because you're just constantly being shown these animations, it's quite hard. I find this one just kind of amazing, and it made me think that maybe this isn't an issue for attention, maybe this is just that I'm old. You decide. It's kind of a mad website anyway, right? And then if you open the menu, it carries on behind. And I was looking at this just going, I can't, I can't read the menu. There's all this other stuff happening. I think even by most standards, this is quite an energetic website. But I found it so difficult, right? There's just all this crap happening over there. And it's nice, it's kind of well designed, it's you know, it's exciting, it's interesting, but I can't read the menu. So think what it's like to be someone with ADHD or you know, other concentration difficulties. That's pretty tough. Talk about dyslexia only briefly. Um, dyslexia makes reading hard, and it's a spectrum. Some people are really profoundly um, struggle with reading, and other people just find it a little bit tougher than people without dyslexia. But I thought I would, unless there's masses of people in here who read Russian, I thought I'd just give us a little go of what it might be like to have dyslexia. I've made reading really hard for you by presenting a web page in Russian for you. And I'd like you to notice what happens to your attention while we scroll down the web page. If you're struggling to read, and I don't blame you, um, my Russian is not great. Um, for those of you who actually can read Russian, I uh, apologize, we'll do it in Arabic or something next time. If you read both Russian and Arabic, get out. Just kidding. Right, OK, let's see how this goes. So watch what happens to your attention. Like, try and read the text. Where's your attention going? Pictures, right. Which is nice. Um, but the first thing, if you can't kind of get into the text, the first thing that happens is you just get pulled right into the pictures. Get out of Timber again. But like, how interesting is that? That you just... That's what your brain wants to do. It's like, oh, no, this is too hard. I'll just go and look at the shiny things. And that's awesome, but it has something to say, right, for the experience of reading this. Or think, maybe this isn't the experience of someone with dyslexia, and I don't have dyslexia, so I can't really comment on that. I'm just trying to simulate a rough idea. But what if you're a new arrival in a country and you're trying to read, 
um, and you're struggling because I've had this experience myself moving to Norway, but you're trying really hard and yet there are distracting things and every sentence is really difficult, but you want to read and you're just trying your best. But there's all these distractions that make, they're just easier and your attention just wants to go off and look at instead. And there's lots of other illnesses that I'm not even going to talk about here where people's ability to concentrate is just sort of compromised. And there's more, you know, more than I can name, but there are so many diseases and disorders and states of being where it's just a bit harder and just so... It means that we have to be so careful. And these are us. The, the thing I really want to stress is that these are not some other people in a room somewhere who need extra help. These are us. Everyone in this room is going to have problems at some point with various things. Um, you might have low vision. So hands up in here who has uh, some kind of vision correction. Um, for Yeah, that's most people, I think, a majority anyway. I'm wearing contact lenses. Without that, I would struggle. So many web pages. Uh, so if you saw Bruce Lawson, I hope, uh, this morning talking about um, making the web accessible. I was staggered to read that 98% of the top million web pages don't have high enough contrast, for example. And that the second you're not meeting the kind of contrast requirement, how are you supposed to steal, um, steer people's attention, right? How are you going to manage that if they can't see the building blocks of attention steering that you're, you're creating? So there's all kinds of things um, that suddenly, if you just have a little bit of poor vision, make technology so much harder to interact with. Um, I thought I would blow up. So the web page, the kind of really seriously, quite impressively bonkers web page that we just looked at a minute ago, I thought I'd see what it was like if we just blew it up and made it a bit larger. So for people with really low vision, some people use magnification software in their web browser to just, or um, in other packages as well, just to kind of enhance a bit of the screen so that they can just have a blown up version of that and then they kind of navigate around the page to try and catch it all. Um, and I thought, well, what would happen if you were looking at a web page like this but you had to blow it up to be able to read? Kind of even bigger and madder, right? And like, Everything that's moving takes up more space now. How about this? Ever been sleep deprived? Hands up. Who has been sleep? Everybody, or almost everybody. Two really happy people. We hate you. We don't. Um, enjoy not being sleep deprived. For everyone else, uh, what happens when you're sleep deprived? Bad things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, your concentration goes right. It's, it's kind of hard to focus. It's kind of hard to keep focused. I was trying to do a little bit of research to understand what we really know about this. And the best rule of thumb I could find is that when we look at um, brain imaging studies of people who are sleep deprived, what we find is that we can't definitively say that their attention is worse uh, or that the problem solving is worse, uh, although there is some evidence for these. But what we see is that the areas of the brain that they're using to complete thinking tasks, you know, kind of cognition and perception and, all, and memory and all of that stuff, are working harder, which maybe suggests that they're finding it harder. So there's increased effort required to kind of perform at the same level. So that's sort of interesting to know, right, that everything seems to be more effort when we're sleep deprived, but that actually might be reflected in what's happening in the brain. So we have to be super kind to all the people who are sleep deprived. So everyone who's using the software that you make, you know, maybe they have a new baby at home, maybe they're just going through a period of insomnia. So many reasons why someone might be sleep deprived. Maybe they have chronic pain and so they don't sleep well at night. So many reasons. So we have to construct an attention experience that's kind of really meaningful for them. Oh, I hope this is the B. This is not the B. What a shame. All right. Whoa. What just happened? This is a mean pop-up. Like, it takes the whole screen. It's really big and loud. How do you dismiss it? Anyone catch it? Cross on the top left. It takes a long time to find that cross. I know we're used to looking for a cross, but it's low contrast, which doesn't help. Sorry, this is going to keep looping. Um, it's low contrast, but also the visual weight of all the other things is right at the opposite end. Huge button, flashing cursor. Takes a long time to find that. And it just doesn't need to be that mean. 
There are better ways of getting people's attention. Right. I think this is the doozy. I found the mother load of attention, like, messing. Pretty sure this is it. It just made me so happy. Like, not because this is really good web design, but because I, I'm never going to see anything as impressive as this. And I don't think you are either. So just enjoy. We're not even done. Wait for it. Boom. How good is that? I was really genuinely happy when I found this, because I think this is doing absolutely everything you shouldn't do. So my, my take home from this is actually just never do any of this, and you'll be making a really good web page or a really good application. Right, so we've got movement up there. Uh, we've got lots of dark stuff, lots of ink, right? When the cursor goes over Instagram, oh, there we go. We can pin that now. So now that's moved. Um, we've got like janky scrolling, which is not great. Um, we've got things that are animating. Oh yeah, little guy coming in there. We've got that, that's new. Some of the time the ads scroll with the page, some of them they don't. Um, oh, lots of stuff raining over here. Um, oh, color, oh look, movement over there and over there. Uh, this is going, oh he's going again. Um, this is just extraordinary, that changed again. Now pop-ups from both sides. And I just want to read about the author, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting, and that animates, and then, wow, the comments field. I, I have no words. This is amazing. So <laughs> the question is, given all of that, is it ever OK to use some of these positively? And yes, it absolutely is. So I wanted to sort of talk about the applications of some of these. So this is. Um, I find this really interesting, right? This is, uh, as far as I can tell, real instrumentation data. And this is for someone flying a plane, and I'm going to suggest it's probably more complicated than this, like uh, there's more controls somewhere. <laughs> but this is just the thing that I found on the web. And this is so interesting to me, because it's a lot of information. But watch what's happening to your attention. You can, it, does it work for you? Because it kind of works for me. I'm like, oh, I can see when something's changed. And I kind of I notice because my attention gets pulled there, but it's only a little change. And then I can look at the next thing that changes. And because nothing is changing a lot, and nothing is quite changing continuously, and because there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things, which is quite a lot, but it's OK, it sort of feels manageable. And think that like you've spent loads and loads of hours getting used to this, so you're now like a professional at this, and you can do it. It's completely manageable. And this is like a big difference between things for naive users and things for expert users, right? Is that this is for someone who spends a lot of time looking at this display. And this is actually really simple for someone who spends a lot of time looking at this display. But even for us, if we just sit and look at it, it's quite soothing, actually. I quite like it. Um, it, it kind of seems OK. And I think this is sort of a nice example of where complex information feels manageable. There's the whole other thing about driving a plane. But this is, this is OK. Will someone else do the other thing? And actually, well-handled animations can really enhance the user experience. And I've got like two minutes left here. So these are for you to kind of play with at home more. Um, but if we just sort of come out of here and see if we can go to those, and wouldn't you know they've disappeared. Awesome. So there's some really lovely examples um, in some blog posts about using animation to improve usability. Play that up a little bit. So the difference between sort of like just really blunt cuts 
and then kind of animating it smoothly are really useful because they help people, they help transition and steer people's attention. So easing in and easing out and functions like that are really friendly and they can really help you orient people towards what it is that they should be looking at. And some of these are like, they, you don't need them. Like, this would be the first thing to go if I had any kind of graceful degradation issues on a web page. Uh, I don't care about this in a way, but it's nice. It can add, like, it can add something to the user experience. Feedback to highlight stuff that went wrong is really nice, right? I don't, by the way, agree with the fact that they've got placeholder text, but we'll do that another time. Um, but this is good, right? It's kind of attention grabbing. Movement is always a great pull for attention. Anything moves, you're, you just orient towards it. And when you press things, it's lovely if they animate, because you kind of, it feels like you're actually touching a physical thing. So these are great kind of feedback tools. Steering and feedback are super nice. Um, so that's that one. Uh, and then there was one more. I've got 48 seconds left. Let's go have a quick look at this. Disney have come up with amazing principles for animation. And they're so good that you can't see them. There we go. All right. So again, lots of easing in and easing out and so on. And this is only going to work if, yes, there we go. So feedback is lovely. Animations that people can follow, like if a thing just disappears, you're not going to know where it went. But if you see it animate, we get a sense of direction. And very early centers in the brain, things that are very close to the actual perception of something in time. I'm um, really grateful for this, because it allows you to track an object that's moving in a direction. You've got other things like that. Lots of beautiful stuff about steering. I'll leave these links in the, um, in the notes, and this one's never going to load. Oh, there we go. This is just showing off, but it's lovely. <laughs> like, I'm not sure how much it adds. But easing in and out and stuff like that, it really helps people orient. It really helps frame information. And as we saw in the kind of do not do this example, it's so useful when you, can, when you know what not to do that you can kind of use that as the case to do better stuff. Right. I have run out of time. So what about profit? Very briefly. Statistics. This is all of the people who might stop using the stuff or not be able to use the stuff that you make. And some of those are the same people, and some of those are different people. But do you actually want like 100% of your possible? Hey, I should make the thing play. Do you want 100% of your possible audience, your possible customer base? Because if you do, then you've got to make stuff that works for all of these people. And we're out of time, so I don't know whether there will be questions. Um, but if you have questions, please come and speak to me afterwards. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.